Welcome everyone. I'm Anne Schreffler and I'm delighted to welcome you to our session. This room is constructed in a kind of an odd way. It's a very long room. I kind of look like I'm, I kind of imagine that I'm looking down a train aisle or something. So I'm inviting you to come forward if you wish. Please come forward and um, come to the front. Also, you will have wonderful things that you will be able to see if you come to the front because this session includes some show and tell. Um, you'll find out. So you won't see that if you're in the back. You can sit wherever you like, but if you come to the front, you will see more. So please do. So welcome to um, the session, Louisville's Unconscious Composers, Mildred Hill, the Courier Women's Edition, and how Happy Birthday was made from African American street cries. I'm very excited about this session, and I was thrilled when Professor Michael Beckerman suggested it and organized it because there's probably not another song that we know better than this one, but at least speaking for myself, that we know the least about. You know, we, we know very, I know very little about this song, but of course it's ubiquitous, so I'm very excited about this session and um, finding out more about it. Professor Beckerman is the Carol and Milton Petrie Professor of Music and the Collegiate Professor of Music at New York University. He's also a distinguished professor at the University of Lancaster. Of course, we all know Professor Beckerman's many books and articles, his scholarly work on Czech music, particularly on Janáček, Dvořák, Martinu, and his books and articles in these fields have received many awards. Um, he has also received um, an honorary doctorate from the, I'm probably pronouncing this wrong, the Palaki University in the Czech Republic. Professor Beckerman has also worked on music in concentration camps and um, some composers in Theresienstadt, Terezin, Pavel Haas, Gideon Klein, and issues of exile experiences, nationalism, immigration, national identity. Michael Beckerman's international activities, his very extensive international activities, include serving on the editorial board of the Complete Dvorak edition and on the International Board of Governors of the Jerusalem Academy of Music and Dance. Professor Beckerman has also contributed, contributed articles to many leading newspapers, including the New York Times. He is a pioneer, one of the voices of public musicology. We now call it public musicology. You did it before it was called that. And um, has served, uh, has uh, uh, been on radio, television, film, and has been a vital presence in um, concert halls and opera houses doing wonderful, uh, famous pre-concert uh, talks around the world. And I am also very proud to say that he served as vice president of the American Musicological Society. So, <laughs> among many, many other honors. So, let's welcome Professor Beckerman, who will, uh, during the course of this session, introduce the other participants and run the show. And I will just sit and watch. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Anne, and, and thanks to all of you for <coughs> sacrificing your lunch hour. Um, I hope you get some lunch after. Uh, when I heard about this session uh, in Louisville, I, I thought it would be, be an interesting thing to try to do something I've tried to do in other places, which is to try to bring together uh, members of an academic, scholarly community with people working on the ground with a range of concerns about local issues and, and conditions. And I thought that would be, again, an exciting thing. So I've invited some wonderful guests along the way, and I'll introduce them as they come up, um, that, the, that the issues we're going to touch on uh, involve things like race and history and gender and ethics and pedagogy and the nature of investigation is, is simply to be expected. And while I hope we'll have a chance to look more broadly at both issues and conditions related to Louisville, the focus of this talk really will be Mildred Hill, Street Cries, and the composition of Happy Birthday. So I'd like to introduce uh, the first person who's going to make some remarks. Um, I'm very fortunate to have had many wonderful graduate students, but only one who's from Louisville. Uh, and so I'd like to introduce Dr. Andrew Burgard, who's just finished uh, his dissertation 
on Janacek in Louisville. No, just on <laughs> and, uh, and he's going to make some remarks uh, about both coming of age in Louisville, but also about some uh, local institutions. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Let's see. There. Um, I'm delighted that Mike asked me to give a short personal preamble about Louisville's music history. I was born here and grew up entirely in Louisville, but moved away after I finished high school. I come back at least once or twice per year, but coming here for AMS is a real treat. Like many native Louisvillians, I have an enthusiastic civic pride that compels us to make people like it here. Um, often self-effacing and not especially competitive, we're nevertheless eager to assert our underappreciated importance. We're usually armed, with, uh, armed and ready with a long list of mainly B-list celebrities from Louisville, as well as factually suspect trivia about our history and our culture. It also seems especially appropriate for me that AMS is held here at the Galt House. Not because it's the fanciest or most historic hotel in town, although its original uh, namesake located around the corner uh, was the pride of Louisville's 19th century hostelry and hosted American presidents, the Russian crown prince, Charles Dickens, Kosut, and many others. Um, but for me, the Galt House means all state band. One of my favorite weeks of the year during high school We'd get out of school for several days, sleep four to a room upstairs, and rehearse for, it seemed like 10 hours a day, uh, in preparation for our weekend concert in Whitney Hall, next door at the Kentucky Center for the Arts. At that point, I was no stranger to Whitney Hall, where I'd seen many Louisville Orchestra concerts um, dating back to the children's concerts when I was a kid. And in fact, a few months after the last Allstate concert, I was in the audience at Whitney when I stubbornly chose to attend a Louisville Orchestra concert instead of going to my high school senior prom. No, seriously, I had a date. I just knew I wasn't going to have fun. Um, and then who could guess that one day I'd become a musicologist? Um, so after I left for college and expanded my musical horizons further beyond the concert band, I took some misbegotten personal pride in my hometown orchestra when I discovered that it had an outside reputation within those classical music circles with higher academic prestige that I aspired to join. This reputation was, of course, based on the commissioning project of the 1950s and 60s and the first recording series. These programs have long since ceased, and by the time I finished high school, the orchestra was already facing irreversibly diminished financial prospects. But I also learned that Louisville was known within these circles for the Grammar, and that I could boast that my hometown was home to arguably the most prestigious prize for musical composition in the whole world, and administered by the University of Louisville School of Music, where I'd spent many, many hours during high school. These distinguished local musical institutions all belong uh, to fairly recent history. The Grawmeyer dates only from the mid-80s. The orchestra and the university's music school were both established in the 1930s, whereas this session concerns the sonic and musical world of the city a half century earlier. Around the end of the 19th century, the city's musical life was not rooted in such strong institutions, but was instead organized by amateur and semi-professional music, music clubs, choral societies, and cultural associations. In this regard, Louisville's resembled the bourgeois musical scene of many comparably sized cities across the US, Europe, and the European colonies. Um, and I expect most of you will be familiar with this framework from some other context, so instead of giving a condensed description of the fairly predictable structure and repertoire in Louisville at this time, I'm just going to mention a few uh, distinctive elements of 19th century Louisville history that shaped the city's musical life in the decades around 1900. Um, by far the most historically significant foreign immigrant population in 19th century Louisville was German. German immigrants and their children accounted for about one-third of the city's entire population during the second half of the 19th century. And this community had a strong and lasting legacy on the city's character during the 20th century and today. Go south, east, east, southeast of downtown, you come first to Germantown in Schinselberg, um, and about a third of the city today is said to claim German heritage. And you'll see all of the old businesses um, the old local thing, known businesses will have German names on them. Um, but so beginning in the 1850s, uh, there was uh, widespread bilingual education, even at public schools, and their kindergartens were important early precedents for the later work of the Hill Sisters. The most prominent of the many German language newspapers created during the second half of the 19th century, the Louisville Anzeiger, was established in 1849 and printed in German up until its demise in 1938. Most of the German immigrants from this area 
I think this is actually true. Maybe someone can help me if this is actually most or not. But a large number of the German immigrants from this era were Catholic, giving Louisville an unusually high number of Catholics for a southern city, which remains true today. But it also included a large number of socialists and atheists who left Europe after the 1848 revolutions were defeated. Um, many established old Louisville families mistrusted both elements, feeling a, feeling a powerful know-nothing party in combustible social tensions uh, that led to the 1855 Bloody Monday Election Day riots that left 22 people dead, instigated by nativist mobs formed to guard the polls from Germans. And briefly, since it's not going to figure in anywhere else here in my brief talk, I want to note that in subsequent decades, the Germans uh, were predominantly pro-Union, and even often non-slave-owning nativists were mostly pro-Confederacy. And so when the African-American population of Louisville increased dramatically after the Civil War, one of the largest and certainly the most historically durable uh, black neighborhoods, Smoketown, is, was mostly surrounded by German neighborhoods. Um, so a musical takeaway from that is, like in many comparable cities, German-style ensembles predominated in the musical landscape of 19th century Louisville, and German-born musicians were brought to town to lead these groups. But here, many of the important musical societies of the time, like the Liederkranz, were German-language, and their members were often marginalized immigrants more than members of the bourgeoisie. However, as these social tensions decreased between nativist and immigrants and cultural, assimil cultural assimilation became more common towards the end of the century, these singing groups often served to promote liberal ideas and to broker civic unity. In 1886, when Louisville hosted the first national Zingerfest in the West, uh, a local newspaper reported that, quote, the Central Committee for this festival have united with their American fellow citizens of Louisville, and the most cordial reception and assistance have been proffered by the latter, so that the splendor of the occasion will be unusual, and the festival will not be confined to the Germans alone, but will be a popular one in the broadest sense. Uh, and the last thing I'm going to mention is the, unfortunately very briefly, is the Southern Exposition, held in Louisville from 1883 to 1887. Oh, do we have this? Can you throw that on there for me? Yeah. Great. Um, it sh which showcased Louisville's recent manufacturing growth and helped to launch a new industrial boom that drove Louisville's transformation into a modern city in multiple senses. Occupying 40 acres that were then the urban fringe but now is the heart of old Louisville, the exposition lavishly displayed the splendors and conveniences of, of modern innovation, attracting throngs of visitors both local and from around the nation. The vast central building that we have here spread over 12 acres and featured electric illumina illumination on an unprecedented scale that allowed its activities to continue well into the night. These activities included numerous concerts by nationally renowned orchestras and military bands. This included performances um, by two leading regiment bands from New York, which Mildred Hill, in her history of Louisville music, described as presenting, quote, the best, the best class of music of which a brass band is capable. Um, and also a young uh, Walter Damroche's 40-piece orchestra. Um, and Mildred Hill, in that history, described the importance of these concerts at this other exposition in this following quote I'm going to read. The result was that no city was ever blessed with a series of concerts of a higher order of music, and the genuine love of music by the Louisville public was evidenced by their appreciation of the music thus offered them. Uh, nothing has ever done so much to cultivate and elevate the musical taste of the city as these concerts. And musicians look back to, to these days as a red letter time in the musical history of Louisville. And so the exposition introduced the city to a new scale of professional music making that built interest and support for the development of a permanent local ensemble of that size and quality that ultimately was achieved in the 1930s. So stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, my own relationship to Louisville belongs uh, with this uh, President James K. Polk. No, that's not Polk, that's Dvorak, of course. Um, and uh, my first contacts occurred um, when I was following up on a comment by James Huneker, who claimed to be the first person to get Dvorak interested in using African-American melodies as, to make a symphony. Uh, he, he mentions that he brought Dvorak an article and the article was called uh, Negro Music. It was published in 1892 in the journal Music out of Chicago. Uh, and it tries to make a broad case for the power and the purity and the essential usefulness of black music for musicians. Uh, so laden with illustrations, it uh, begins by outlining the power of music to 
call forth images of the past. As you can see, it begins recalling the childhood in the South. <clears throat> the second part is a, a theoretical recipe, uh, talks about scales and uh, the, the Egyptians and the Eskimos, syncopations, and as you can see, uh, various tunes. And then um, it makes a kind of peroration at the end uh, when our American musical messiah sees fit to be born. He will then find ready to his hand a mass of lyrical and dramatic themes with which to construct a distinctively American music. Um, and as you can see, it's signed um, Johann Tanzor, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, we'll come back to that, but the tunes are, are things, this is one of the tunes, and um well, as I imagined, Dvorak. This. And again, it's signed um, Johann Tanzor, uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And um, Dvorak, after doing that, uh, finishing the New World Symphony, wrote uh, again famously, I'm now satisfied that the future music of this country must be founded on what are called the Negro melodies. So I had done a bunch of work on this to establish this or that and make sure it was really the right article that Hanukkah was referring to. And at the end of the process, my last little bit of cleanup, which I thought would take me one phone call, was just finding whoever this Johann Tanzor was and, and have done with it. So I called Penn Bogert, uh, then uh, at what was called the Filson Club and um, asked him if he could just find a little bit about this no doubt famous German Louisvillian, uh, and uh, he didn't call back, so I called again, and I said, what, what's up? And he said, um, I couldn't find uh, Johann Tanzer. So, I, so, you know, back in the days, you'd, you'd call and you'd ask for somebody's phone number, and they say, you don't, don't have it. You say, could you try the next town over? So I said, could you try the next town over or whatever? And he said, no, you don't understand. There's no surname Tansor in Kentucky between 1840 and 1920. So um, I knew it was some kind of pseudonym, but the question was, who was it? Well, before we talk about that, um, I would like to introduce uh, my new friend and colleague, Jim Holmberg, who's the head curator of the Filson Historical uh, Society, who will tell you something about its holdings. It's a pleasure to be here and speak to you all today about the Filson and, and our holdings. And, and you all may have already encountered this a little bit, but Louisville is kind of a big town, but it's also a little town. And I met Andrew out in the hallway, and he says, do you remember me? And I, and I said, well, you know, the name kind of rings a bell. He says, well, you were the judge. We had a high school quiz show here in town for many, many years, and I was the judge. And he said, I was on one of the teams that competed in front of you. So it is indeed a small town, and it's good to see that you've done good. Uh, the Filson is 131 years old. We're, we're the Kentucky's privately supported historical society. Ten guys with a common love of history got together back in 1884 and uh, founded the Filson Club, as, as uh, Mike, when he first encountered it, knew it to be. Uh, we uh, are a fully staffed professional historical society. The club name is kind of a misnomer and it, it got dropped and so now we are officially the Filson Historical Society. But in our 131 years we've been uh, actively collecting and preserving not only Kentucky but the Ohio Valley and the Upper South uh, historical heritage. And much of that is music. Uh, we have a manuscript division, photographs and prints, museum, library, and in those, those vast holdings, uh, we probably have accumulated, and other people from other institutions have told me this, so I'm not making it up, that we have the finest collection of pioneer, antebellum, and Civil War manuscripts in the state. 
Uh, many of our early members, our founders, were old Kentucky families, and they gave us their papers, and we have actively collected them since then, uh, primarily through donation as, as the means of, of growing our collection in large ways, but also through uh, acquisitions and, and collecting. We have an acquisitions budget, and we have bought things through the year, sometimes music, uh, many times other, other subjects. And we have researchers come from like, like Mike uh, from uh, across the country and around the world because much of what we have is unique. It's that one letter. It might be that one original manuscript of a composition or something like that. Uh, and so those researchers come in to mine this very rich historical field of what we have available and what we've been collecting and preserving for well over a century now. We're in the midst now of a major expansion uh, with an entirely new building and a renovated uh, headquarters and a, and a beautiful Beaux-Arts mansion down in Old Louisville, uh, an area that, that Andrew had, had mentioned. Uh, we're, uh, we're essentially kind of in the front yard of where the Southern Expo was uh, back in the 1880s, and it's a beautiful area. If you get a chance, come down and roam around St. James Court and, and, and that area. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, and among our collections, I want to speak a little specifically to kind of an overview of our music collection because that clearly is your all's uh, subject of interest. Mike brought, asked me to bring in a couple of samples here, uh, and he'll speak obviously in his remarks more specifically to these, but the satin edition, as we call it, which was the woman's edition from the, there it is, uh, from 1895 for the Courier Journal, which women uh, uh, contributed the articles to this on, uh, on a variety of, of subjects. Uh, the Filson uh, had very many early women members and some of them were musically inclined. The Hill Sisters, uh, we have the Patty Smith Hill, the sister of Mildred. We have her papers, a large collection of her papers. We have some of Mildred's. Uh, and Mike, of course, is gonna speak more specifically to that, but just kind of a brief overview uh, of just some of the music collections we're doing. Now I want to, before I forget, you know, we have a website just as everybody does. Uh, and you can go on and, and look on our online catalog for some specifics, be it print, manuscript, photograph, what have you. More and more, of course, is getting digitized and, and online. Uh, that's going to be a major endeavor of ours in the future in our new facility. Uh, but we're also now working on something called the virtual card catalog which we've taken our some 80,000 card manuscript card catalog and we've digitized it. And as we're going through and proofing it, you will be able to get online and actually read very often very specific cards regarding music or the Civil War or Pioneers or Mildred Hill or, or what have you. Uh, so keep an eye out if you're interested in, in Kentucky, Louisville, and the region's musical history and heritage uh, keep an eye out for that. You can go to our website and tap in to that. It gets Google crawled so it shows up. And we've actually gotten queries on this already for what is partially online from people from around uh, the, the globe, internationally already. And it's a great way to let your fingertips do the, do the searching. Uh, everybody's probably heard of uh, 15 Men on Dead Man's Chest, you know, Yo Ho Ho. Uh, Young E. Allison in Little Villian. Uh, uh, took those, those few lines out of Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island and, and, and wrote a poem, which later was set to music, and uh, they called the Deer Lect. Uh, we have a large collection of Young E. Allison papers. Will S. Hayes, one of the most famous American composers of the mid-19th century, he was a Louisvillian. We have a large collection of his sheet music and some of his manuscripts, as well as photos and things like that. He claimed he wrote Dixie, uh, which I think has pretty much been disproved, uh, but uh, he, he thought he did, and many other people, and the family still today tell me, well, you know, he wrote Dixie. Uh, I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, Mildred Hill, of course, uh, manuscripts of hers and, and, and printed material. Mary Newcomb, who collected uh, uh, Appalachian folk music. Uh, we have a, a collection of, of her, uh, her works and, and things that she had transcribed. Uh, Science Hill Female Academy, about 30 miles east of Louisville, was one of the finest girls uh, prep schools in the country, in the South, uh, from the 1830s uh, to the 1930s when it closed down. 
Uh, we have a large collection of the music books and manuscripts, sheet music, that they use there at the school to teach girls some of the things that they should know. Uh, to this, we also have a large sheet music collection, much of it 19th century and into the early 20th century. Uh, Mary Fitzhugh, again, a composer who, who wrote various songs, uh, including one in 1906 uh, that, uh, that's uh, called Cornbread and Greens. I don't know how good it is. I've never actually heard it play. Uh, Everett Mock here and here and actually across the river in New Albany was a, a real jazz enthusiast and a collector. Uh, he, uh, he gave, well after his death, his, his sister uh, gave some of his papers to us uh, with some correspondence from some musicians, uh, jazz musicians of the, of the 20th century. His uh, major private uh, actual record collection is now at the Indiana University. Uh, library, probably their music school library. Joseph S. Cotter, uh, senior, a well-known composer. Uh, we have his manuscript of I'm Wandering, a Spiritual. Uh, and then we have clubs. Uh, Andrew mentioned Louisville's fine music tradition uh, where groups got together. We have a beautiful print from the mid-19th century of the Liederkranz, uh, the German singing societies, and they're all standing there. It's a print about like that. And they're all identified, and if their instrument was small enough, they're holding it. They're in the print. Uh, and it's a, it's a wonderful image to get that feel. We also have a complete run, as complete a run as exists of the Anzeiger. And if you can read German, uh, music fills a lot of those pages. It's uh, currently uh, available on, well, given our renovations, it's not available right now, but will be again once we're fully up and running again. Well, we have the Musical Club of Louisville, uh, their records from 1884 to 1900. The Music Study Club, a, a different group, 1891 to 1943. Uh, the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, had their encampment, their national encampment in Louisville in 1895. And even though Kentucky was a loyal state uh, during the Civil War and sent a ratio of men three to one to the, to the north rather than to the south, the GAR announced that it was their first uh, national encampment that was going to be held in the South, uh, in the old enemy territory. And so that's how things get you know, kind of stuck in people's minds. But the Halls and Campfires Committee that was in charge of the music for the parades and the campfires that, that men would meet around, uh, we have the records from that committee and the correspondence and what they were planning and, and things like that. Uh, much more recently, probably one of our most recent musical collections is Faith Pillow, who is a singer and a composer, a native of Louisville, who had a career in Chicago and abroad, uh, I think uh, in Germany and the Netherlands mostly, in Denmark. Uh, uh, we have a, a collection of her works that her uh, husband, after she uh, sadly passed away rather young, uh, and her husband gave us a collection of her works. Uh, so that's just a nice quick overview of, of what we have at the Filson, and if uh, your travels bring you back to Louisville again, or if you happen to be local, uh, please come in and check or look at our website too, and uh, learn more about what we've been working to uh, preserve and make available to scholars and those interested for the last 131 years. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for that. That's, that's great. Um, well, great uh, is this. I think uh, the satin edition uh, of, of the Louisville Courier Journal is, for me, one of the most fascinating documents uh, that I've seen from the 19th century. Uh, <clears throat> the, it, the attempt was made for kind of fundraising purposes to one day a year turn the entire operation of the newspaper over to women. That is, from the typesetting to the editorials to all the articles. Uh, you can see here, it has the editor-in-chief, assistant editor, all the different departments are, are staffed by, by women. Um, and uh, again, um, in the mid-1890s, philanthropic projects like these women's clubs um, worked with newspapers and again and fundraisers and they were, these were distinctly different from say the women's pages of a newspaper. When I first heard about this I thought it was you know 
homemaking, but it's absolutely the opposite. Uh, this was a situation where many women who couldn't publish under their own names uh, actually used this as a repository for their scholarly work. Uh, and so you have a daily newspaper that's much more like a, a, a high-class scholarly journal. Uh, the front page looks like a front page. Uh, it's just reportage, and, um, but, but all women reporters. Um, but there are women's issues throughout. Um, as you can see, Wellesley, from an educational standpoint, the sort of articles about education, uh, articles about women around the world. This is an article on, on women of Algiers. Uh, scientific studies, a lesson in experimental psychology, normal training, and of course uh, a great deal of uh, social consciousness. On the left side you see what are we doing to save young girls about uh, labor laws, and on the right the black list of states, the age at which women could actually be given uh, in marriage without their consent. So these were issues taken up, many of them, in, in this uh, uh, women's, the women's edition of The Courier. Um, there was a, a full music section, and this is uh, the, the main page of the music section. The titles read, Women in Music, First Recognized by the World's Fair, Their Advancement, No Concessions, Now Asked of the Sterner Sex, Standing on Their Merit. Uh, and there was a nice little insignia here, as you can see. Uh, not only do you have the, the, the singer and the little angels, but you, you can see the... little old Kentucky home, uh, ostensibly being blown by the putti with a little uh, trumpet. Um, so again, this is, this is the article. Here you can see the close-up uh, with this nice, nice article about a violinist. Um, there were musical notes about Chaminade, Mar Margaret Reuven Lang, Augusta Holmes, Amy Beach. So everything in this section, as it was in the other sections in this paper, focused on women and women's issues. Um, and you can see um, on the left uh, is a bunch of musical examples. I shall um, unveil the... Uh, there it is. Uh, unconscious Composers, that's uh, uh, an article that appeared on Unconscious Composers, and as, as you can see, um, it's, it's a long article, uh, it's got 17 musical examples, uh, and it's, uh, again, it was uh, an interesting piece with all kinds of, of writing about it. Um, it, it uh, refers to um, Dr. Dvorak's opinion. And uh, it's uh, you know, a fascinating article that, that again, raises all kinds uh, of issues. Um, and doc, uh, we'll talk a little bit about Dr. Dvorak's opinion. But um, before we do, you can see at the very bottom there, it's signed MJH. Uh, and that, of course, is. Um, our hero of the day, Mildred Hill. Um, uh, Mildred Hill was born in 1859, died in 1916. She came from one of the more remarkable families in the country. Um, her mother uh, and father were uh, progressive educators, to say the least. Um, the children were brought up in an atmosphere where they were encouraged to do kind of various play at play stations around the house. Uh, Mildred grew up, uh, you'll hear more about her, her sister uh, Patty Hill, um, who is, uh, as we discussed yesterday, sometimes described as a, quote, kindergarten teacher, which she was at one point, was also the first female full professor uh, at Columbia University. Uh, and her sister was also a full professor at Columbia University, so it's an absolutely remarkable, remarkable family. Uh, we can see here that Mildred was um, the editor of the music department of the Women's Edition. And I'll say a few things about Mildred. She was really a remarkable woman. If I call her Mildred, it's not because I'm so familiar with her, but not to confuse her with her equally famous sister, Patty, uh, who sort of invented, along with other colleagues, the American concept of, of kindergarten. 
Uh, she was a writer and a critic. She wrote uh, a, a, an interesting and engaged chapter about history of music in Louisville from a musicological point of view. She was uh, a eth ethnographer of black music. Um, it, anybody, I think it's a spectacular topic. I mean, I think that you know, writing about the woman's edition is equally spectacular, but there are two hymnals um, in uh, the University of Oregon library uh, that have the, hy the, the hymns that Mildred Hill collected in central Kentucky. She went out to, and did field work, and this is where her address, the Jubilee songs, and these are some examples of the hymn tunes that she collected and wrote about. And she wrote about them with, with a great deal of knowledge. She made it clear to her readers that they didn't sound like they appeared on the page and tried to describe the local methods of singing. Um, she uh, kept a scrapbook of, of articles on folk music, uh, the very latest ones by Henry Crabill and many others. And of course, at the very back of this lovely scrapbook, she stuck her own article on street cries, uh, perhaps feeling that it belonged there. She was also a composer um, and was featured on many concerts in, in, in Louisville. Uh, here's another one, uh, manuscript song recital. And uh, you can see what the program was, a series of pieces by Mildred Hill, one or two by others. She wrote popular songs, this wonderful March On, Brave Lads March On uh, from the Spanish-American War. And she wrote piano pieces as well. So I thought we should, um, I, I was shown this uh, yesterday for the first time by James Purcell, who you'll meet in a moment, who's the music librarian at the University of, of Louisville. And we thought we should have at least one world premiere, so. <laughs> Do you want the unmanuscript? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's always best to do premieres from the original. What's the title? A memory. A memory. A memory. A memory. A memory. I should have played it and then asked what you thought. <laughs> <laughs> soundtrack for the Mildred Hill story. <laughs> At any rate, so here's, here's the, the article that we're talking about, uh, this unconscious uh, composers, and you can see the things all laid out here. And she begins by talking about Dr. Dvorak's opinion, and, and she quotes him, 
as she makes a statement quoting him from his article, Music in America, where he says that anyone who wants to know a country should listen not only to the great music of the country, but to people on the street singing anything that they can find, a famous story that Dvorak told William Arms Fisher, who wrote the words, going home to the Largo, that he was walking past the toy store and there was a piano in the window and on the tiny little piano, the miniature piano was a miniature piece of music and Dvorak said, und I looked at it and it war gut, uh, and he wrote down that. So the idea that you should collect all scraps uh, and Mildred, of course, uh, was, was uh, taken by that and mentions it. So we'd like to look at this Street Cry article. Um, and uh, she again said that Dvorak gives much food for thought. Uh, and again, Dvorak's statement was, every now and then I catch a strain or hear the fragments of a recurring melodic theme that sounds like the voice of the people. And um, Mildred begins by pointing out that, as she puts it, the street cries of our own city are much more musical than cities further north and east and therefore more valuable to musicians. She writes, it is the Negro who furnishes us with the most interesting street cries in this part of the country. A few illustrations, as she puts it, from both whites and Negroes will make this plain. Says so the ordinary white street vendor has a good idea of time and tune. His calls are full of both and are vigorous and to the point as the following examples will show. Um, and uh, let's have a couple of the street cries. Let's have the, the, the first one. And I'm going to ask uh, Miriam Frank, who's a uh, student at Royal Holloway and also a uh, professional singer, to come and sing some of the street cries. Morning paper. So right, so we have this is just a little street cry announcing the morning paper. Um, then is, is there are a couple more. Uh, she says an article in the Music Review several years ago by Juliet Graves on the street calls of Chicago and Buffalo brought to light the interesting fact that the calls of the white newsboys in those cities and our own are much the same. So these are a couple of other street cries of the. The, the white newsboys. Strawberries, strawberries, ripe cherries, ripe cherries. <laughs> strawberries, strawberries, fresh and ripe. No, sorry, I was wrong. Which one am I singing? That's fine. Let's do that one again. Strawberries, strawberries, fresh and ripe, right off the vine. And she goes on to say, evade it as we may. I love that. Um, the fact remains that genuine Negro music is the most characteristic we have in this country. Dvorak pertinently asks what melody could stop an American on the street in a strange land and make it the home feeling well up within him. Any of our ordinary popular songs would attract his attention, but it would be the real Negro melody that would bring tears to his eyes. This would assuredly be true of a southerner. We must always make the distinction between genuine music of this kind and the numberless imitations, minstrel shows, and the like. So we have uh, especially these songs. Um, Old man drops stone dead with the coal. Coal, coal, because he wouldn't buy no coal, because he wouldn't buy no coal. So that's a little coal song that she took down. Several of these are quo ho, quo ho, quo ho, 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 ho. And this one, which she said, um, she met uh, a, a black man who told her, I made it up out of my own head. I just whistled it to let folks know I'm passing by, but never knowed no white folks was noticing it. So this is this. So again, it's uh, 
uh, an elaborate little tune. So one thing that this article makes clear, which has not to do with our main subject, is um, some tedious uh, commentary that uh, undoubtedly um, Mildred Hill is Johann Tanzor. Uh, she, not only was she the only person who had the set of skills and background to, to write Tansor's article, but she uses the same words in, in her published works that are under her own name as Johann Tansor uses. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, clear that, again, Tansor wrote this, and, and to make it even clearer that, that Tansor's article played a profound role in Dvorak's decision to create a certain kind of American music. So furnished the examples, the exhortation, uh, and, the, and the theoretical background that Dvorak was to quote almost verbatim in his famous article on the subject, and I'll come back to that. Well, there's one composition uh, by Mildred Hill that I didn't allude to uh, in my, my earlier remarks. It's, there's a, a real copy of the edition right here, but that's um, the song stories for uh, kindergarten. This was written by Mildred and Patty, published first in 1893, though the song must have been written earlier. And of course, it's most famous for the song, uh, Good Morning to All, which we're now going to sing. Yeah. <laughs> Mary? Um, so. Just, um, there's a wonderful book called um, How, How Buildings Learn, which looks at actually pairs of buildings in places like New York that were once exactly the same, but over time transformed. So there's a whole thing about how, how a tune like that has changed and transformed over time, slowed down for various reasons. So uh, it's my contention that this short song, uh, with its uh, various movements, like Ba da da di, ba da da di, ba di da. That that shape of happy birthday and its shortness uh, was was modeled on these street cries. Was written with with reference to them, um, and ones like this one as well. And I, this is a little sort of diagram that you know. Again, you have this sort of pentatonic opening of. song uh, seem very close to, to these kinds of uh, things. By the way, um, it's uh, something that's, that's a little bit different, if you can see it. Um, this is, well, I'll show that in a second. Um, so uh, here we have, though, another piece of evidence that uh, could add to what I've already presented. This is a letter that's preserved in the uh, Dvorak Museum in Prague, misfiled under Hill Midred, uh, first name Hill, last name Midred, which is why it took a while to turn up. 
Um, and this was written by Mildred Hill to Dvorak on March 2nd, 1895. She said, uh, you know, honored sir, may I address you on a subject which you seem to be much interested in my street cries. After reading your article in the February Harper, I looked up a collection of street cries I've been gathering for several years and I'm writing an article for the woman's edition. That's how I actually found the woman's edition through this uh, the Courier Journal to illustrate with these cries I send you. I collected them, and this is the pertinent part, I collected them just for the interest I took in them, never expecting to make any use of them, but since I began the study of composition, I've found them very useful. And, and she goes on from there. So she sends him uh, the same cries, but differently numbered. And this is, again, um, kind of interesting because if you, if you look at the uh, Cole song as published in the uh, Courier Journal, when she sends it to him, if you look at the next to last system, so she was a bit more careful. She sent him a slightly different version. And also, um, if you look at this one, this is the version in the courier. And here's the version, uh, sorry, from the. So you get the little grace notes that she's giving to Dvorak. Now, whether she thought that Dvorak could make sense of them and the average reader of the courier journal couldn't, but again, we have a slightly different version here than the one she sends to, to Dvorak. Uh, both of them shared something, uh, I think, rather profound. Um, so this is from The Real Value of Negro Melodies, written in May 1893, where Dvorak says to James Creelman, the famous yellow journalist, I'm now satisfied that the future music of this country must be founded on what are called Negro melodies. They must be the real foundation of any serious and original school of composition. And then Johann Tanser, AKA Mildred, says again, when our American musical messiah sees fit to be born, he'll then find ready to his hand a mass of lyrical and dramatic themes with which to construct a distinctively American music. Um, so uh, I'll have more to say about this and, ex and exactly what I think this meant for both Mildred Hill and Dvorak, but it, I think it very much involved these street cries. But first, I'd like to introduce uh, James Procell, the music librarian at the University of Louisville, who will tell us something about the collections and in particular the Mildred Hill material there. Please give him a warm welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. I did bring a few things uh, for show and tell that uh, if you'd like to come look at uh, afterward, I'd be more than happy to show you. Uh, so a little bit about the music library at the University of Louisville. Um, as far as numbers go, it's a little tough, but roughly 185,000 volumes uh, in the library, uh, maybe about 60,000 scores, so 30 or 40,000 books and uh, m many, many special and archival collections, which I'll talk uh, a little bit about. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, we're probably most well known for our Grawmeyer collection of contemporary music, which is 90% uh, of the scores that have been submitted uh, for the Grawmeyer Award since 1985. We don't have some of the scores from 85 through 87 because in the early years, uh, the composers had the option of requesting their materials be returned to them. Uh, so there's a few scores from the early years that we don't have, but for the most part we've got um, almost all of the scores that have been submitted for that award. Um, roughly a little over 5,000 entries. Uh, we do have all the 2016 entries. The 2016 winner will be announced uh, in a couple of weeks just after Thanksgiving. And one of the really uh, fun things about working in the music library is that uh, we get to know who the winner's going to be uh, a few weeks before, so uh, I just learned who it was, and I'm very excited uh, <laughs> that they're going to announce that. Uh, we do try to buy up all of the, all of the published material for all of the winners, uh, if we can. Uh, for someone like last year's winner, Wolfgang Ring, uh, he's an extremely prolific composer, Twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 worth of materials. Uh, we unfortunately can't get that all at once, so I'm still working uh, on getting these materials. Um, 
Beyond that, we do have many uh, archival and special collections in our library. Um, many, many historical uh, documents related to the history of music in Louisville. Earlier, we saw some photos of the uh, Southern Exposition. We've got concert programs from around that time, uh, tens of thousands of concert programs. Um, many, many, many other things that are sort of unprocessed, uncatalogued, and just sort of hiding away in an archive room where they've been untouched for, for many decades. And uh, I've really been trying for the past, uh, this is my eighth year uh, at UofL, since I started working in the library, I've really tried my best to learn more about what we have in our special collections, uh, document it, provide access to it, uh, because in many cases, it's just a bunch of stuff that's sort of thrown together in a folder, and, and really no one knows that we have it. One of those collections, which I uh, recently received a huge amount of press for this, uh, there was a story about it that got broadcast on NPR, and it was picked up by all sorts of um, national and international uh, news outlets, was Mildred Hill's collection. Um, you know, there's, there's a big lawsuit involving the copyright of this song, and you know, that, that's a topic for a whole other presentation, but I just happened to be in our archive room, not really looking for anything on Mildred Hill, but I was uh, curious if we might have had something on her. I, I didn't really know much about Mildred other than she was from Louisville and that she wrote the Happy Birthday song. So I just happened to be uh, sort of digging through an old file cabinet in our archive room, which uh, rarely gets opened. And, and in that cabinet, and probably most libraries and archives that you visit, you'll find similar file cabinets that contain uh, clippings and photographs and uh, librarians used to collect those sort of things bef before the internet. So these are things of local interest that the librarian thought important to hold on to. So I thought that the folder of Mil that said Mildred Hill on it just contained newspaper article clippings about her or, or other related things. So I never really thought to actually look in the folder. But I was going through the cabinet uh, for a different reason. And this Mildred just happened <coughs> to be in the news. This was maybe a month or two ago when, when all of the, the copyright uh, story was, was uh, going on. And I came across Mildred Hill's folder and I thought, well, maybe I should pull that out and see what we've got in there. And, and instead of clippings and things like that, there, were, there was some of that, um, it's just, it was just a huge pile of manuscripts uh, belonging to Mildred. And, you know, they, they, they're crediting me with, with discovering Mildred Hill's uh, manuscripts. And I don't really want to take credit for it because these, these materials were donated to the library, uh, likely in the 1950s, um, uh, from Hattie Bishop Speed, who's a well-known Louisville musician and philanthropist, uh, and also a friend of Mildred Hill. I believe that Hattie Bishop Speed inherited uh, Mildred's materials when, when Mildred passed away in 1916. And then we got all of Hattie Bishop Speed's things in, in the 50s. So it was known at some point that we had Mildred's manuscripts, but um, it, since we got them in the 50s, it wasn't well documented. You know, this is decades before computer cataloging and all of that. So they've just been sort of sitting in a file cabinet, hiding away, waiting to be found again. And, and so I, I guess I got to be the lucky one that, that came across them. So um, I'm still in the process of going through them, but um, it's interesting that you know, Mildred Hill is, if anyone has ever heard of her in the general public, they, they may just know, oh, well, she wrote the Happy Birthday song, which is true. But everything else about her sort of gets left out. You know, she was uh, indeed a very serious composer, and she wrote real music, as you can see from the piano piece that we heard earlier. Uh, she wasn't just a simple kindergarten song composer. But that's all that, the, that we ever read about her in the news, is that she was a, a, a composer of kindergarten songs, uh, which is true, but there, there's still a lot more about her that always gets left out. Similar to her sister, Patty, who they'll just say her sister, Patty, was a kindergarten teacher. Well, yes, that is true, but you know, she, she was monumental in, in creating kindergarten as we know it in the United States today. So, um, back to the story on Mildred Hill, I do, uh, the, the thing that sort of blew up in the media was this uh, manuscript uh, of Good Morning to You, which is the song that, that became Happy Birthday to You, although the manuscript of it that we have, you, you know, feel free to come up and look at it uh, in a bit, uh, that's, that's it right there actually. Well, You're going to we'll talk sing, about we'll that? You're going to sing it? 
Okay. Okay, we, we can sing it in just a second. You can see that the words are the same, um, the rhythm is the same for the most part, but the melody is, is slightly different. And you see in the very beginning, the word seed is found, which is not in the published version of Good, uh, Good Morning to All. Um, in this manuscript notebook of Mildred's, uh, it starts on page two. We do not have page one. I don't know where that is, which contains the beginning of the song. So the, the news media folks, while I try to convey that this is likely not the original manuscript of Good Morning to All, this appears to be some sort of version of the song, possibly an early version, possibly a later version. Um, because in, in what I've read about Mildred, she would often edit her songs. You know, if the, if the uh, kindergarten kids had a tough time singing a, a particular interval or something like that, she would make it a little simpler. So I really didn't know what this is, uh, what this was. But of course, the, the news media folks, in an attempt to get more clicks and get more views and all of that, uh, sort of reports, not all, but some reported this as the original manuscript for Good Morning to All has been found locked away, you know, you know, they sort of made it a little more than it was. But I, I was really honored that, that I got so much attention for this, because in my normal work as a librarian, you know, I never really I get to do anything with the media. So I got to be on, on a few local uh, morning TV shows and radio shows, and um, a, an interview that I did with our uh, local NPR affiliate got picked up by the big NPR. And so it, it was so bizarre to hear my own voice on, on, on NPR. Uh, so it got, it got a ton of, of press coverage, and still uh, every few days I'll get an email from someone uh, asking more about this. So I'm glad that there, there appears to be interest uh, in the, the music of Mildred Hill. Uh, I'm working on, I just have this idea, I don't really have a concrete uh, idea of what I want to do, but her music, um, much of it was never published. She did have some works published, but many of the things that, of her manuscripts that we have never, uh, never got published, maybe many of them were never even performed. So what I'd like to do, hopefully sometime in 2016, since that would be the 100th anniversary of her death, is to arrange a concert uh, of her works, uh, because I think people would really be interested to hear some of her, her music, and, and, and it would let folks know that yes, she did write real music, not just these uh, simple kindergarten songs, which, which she's most known for. Uh, Mildred passed away in 1916, really a, lo a long time before the song sort of caught on. So she never had any idea that, that her simple little song, which she probably didn't think much about when she wrote it, uh, because it's in a book with, with 70 other songs, what it would go on to become. So I, I, I would really like to put together a concert of Mildred's music and, and have some of it performed. Um, she wrote lots of songs. Uh, uh, several works for solo piano, uh, what appears to be a song cycle or a chamber opera uh, called The Little Mermaid uh, in 1899. Um, and she wrote a, a little bit for strings from what I can tell. I still haven't had a chance to go through everything, but uh, you're all welcome. We're, we're located just a couple of miles down the street, not quite within walking distance, although Mike uh, walked to us yesterday. Uh, if you have some time, while you're here, uh, you're more than welcome to visit us. We're, we're located in the School of Music building at the University of Louisville. I'd be glad um, to tell you more about this collection or, or any of our other collections if you'd like to come for a tour. Um, and do, so we do want to sing uh, yeah, we do. Okay. <laughs> I will step away from the microphone. I'm going to sing it. Everybody else who has a hit, uh, maybe not, as, uh, but tries to have a sequel. And uh, the sequel to Song Stories was a, a, another collection called Songs of Nature and Child Life. Uh, and uh, this, if you can look at the last measure on the first page, uh, the Good Morning Song 
this is, is a, her first copy or, or an autograph of what became uh, a second Good Morning song in a collection that was published uh, in 1898. Um, well, uh, we've established, I think, that, uh, that Mildred is uh, an extraordinary person and, and, a, and a, an amazing resource, and, and her family was as well. And as we know at this point, if you were to look for monuments, uh, you would find um, the Happy Birthday public parking lot. Uh, and e even though there's a nice tribute stone to them, um, there is a sense that they deserve more than that. And uh, I was extremely glad to find before this meeting that there is a group that are, that are dedicated to, to researching and publicizing uh, the Hill Sisters and their legacy uh, through the creation of a, not a parking lot, but a park. And I met many of these, uh, several of these uh, yesterday, Maggie Harlow, Elizabeth Reitmeyer, Terry Connolly, uh, Marsha Weinstein, and they'll talk, some of them will come up and tell you a bit about the project that they're working on to create a, a park here. So please give them a warm welcome. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, very exciting. We just, Michael reached Marsha just over the weekend and suddenly we're with all these people who um, are excited and interested in the same women that we're excited and interested in. So uh, we are really thrilled to be here. I'm Maggie Harlow and I'm, I don't study music. Uh, I don't study history. Uh, but I am a woman and I'm from Louisville. <laughs> <laughs> and so are the Hill Sisters. So. Um, I'm president, uh, current president of the Happy Birthday, the Patty and Mildred Hill Happy Birthday Park nonprofit, and we are. Uh, I'd like my fellow board members to stand. We have um, we have a, a variety of talents. Um, we have a we have women who have history or have a career in education. We have a woman who owns a business that teaches uh, music together, which is. Um, teaching kids about music, families about music, and, and we have corporate leaders, and we have a wonderful team working on this. Um, and our nonprofit formed many years ago because of um, that uh, really offensive, <laughs> frankly, uh, marker um, that sort of came into our consciousness. Uh, Marsha couldn't be here today, but she really kind of founded this movement. And, um, you know, Louisville is a really, really beautiful city. We have really remarkable neighborhoods and some really beautiful markers and, and statues and honors to all sorts of Louisvillians. Um, but there's virtually no public recognition of women. Um, so this is, uh, the, the parking lot is about all we've got so far. So um, we decided that what we wanted to do, to, we wanted to, to honor these Louisville women. They are remarkable global influence um, and we also so we want to teach some some global history uh, but we also felt that doing just a, a statue or a marker of some kind really wasn't honoring them because the sisters were all about play they were all about music they were all about engaging people of all ages and learning together um, and so we decided what really was more appropriate was to build a play space um, a musical space, something that, that they would approve of, and, and we often sort of imagine them at our table when we are having our board meetings. <laughs> what would Patty say? What would Mildred say about what we're working on? Um, so um, we have been raising money. Uh, we have been working on um, figuring out what are we really building and where are we building it? Uh, we have had some opportunities with some spaces, but we're, we're, we're being as picky as we can afford to be in terms of where this is going to be. We know that Patty and Mildred will want this to be accessible to um, kids of all types of backgrounds um, and, and adults of all types of backgrounds, so it's important to us to build something appropriate. Um, so we're working with a design firm locally, a woman-owned design firm called Solid Light, 
and they do experiential design. And so we are working on concepts right now, as well as locations as, as we do our fundraising simultaneously. So we hope to have um, a public space, a fun space, an engaging space, um, here in the upper left, you see this, um, I guess, hurdy-gurdy is the right term for that, um, that might play the happy birthday tune. Um, but we want to create something that is interactive. The sisters were about sort of that open-ended play. Um, and, and all of us are musicians, and all of us are artists, so how do we tap into that? Um, and then we want to also start locally, but we hope to grow globally. So we would love to create an initiative to help other cities and communities build experiences like this that would be Hill Sister approved. Um, and I've, I've, I'd like to put on the, uh, the, I, the dress of Patty and Mildred. I've been known to my sister and I, who happens to be a Patty, she and I happen to dress up in Victorian uh, gear and promote the sisters um, occasionally for our efforts. So we feel like they, we want to make them very real. They were very real, powerful, influential women. So we are delighted, and we hope Mr. Purcell to be talking to you about this concert. We are already in conversation with Teddy Abrams from the Louisville Orchestra, who is quite a rock star here. Um, so we are, we are already engaging the community and figuring out how to really share this remarkable story. And thank you so much for coming here. And if anyone would like to visit with us about our efforts, if you're local or not local, and you'd like to learn more or get engaged, we will loiter a little bit after this event, and we would be delighted to get to know any and all of you. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Maggie, and the rest of the members of the board for coming. It's really been a treat to get to know you. Um, well, it's just some conclusions. Um, uh, this is a, a, a little snippet of the 1935 deposition on the case of Happy Birthday. And as you know, greedy historians will take information wherever they get it. Uh, and and it's, it's sort of interesting what kinds of things you find out from reading depositions that you wouldn't find out elsewhere. But as you can see, uh, question for Patty Hill, how long would you say that you and Miss Mildred worked on the particular song, Good Morning to All? says, well, it was one of the earliest of the group, and for that reason, it took longer to work out with the children. So I, I would say, actually, that they did devote quite special care to this song. It would be written, and I would take it into the school the next morning and test it with the little children. If the register was beyond the children, we went back home at night and altered it, and I would go back the next morning and try it out again until we had secured a song that even the youngest children could learn with perfect ease. Uh, and while only the uh, uh, Norma's good morning to all uh, were put in a book, sorry, only words, 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 sorry, words good morning to all were put in the book, we used it for goodbye to you, happy birth, happy journey to you, happy Christmas to you, and happy New Year to you, happy vacation to you, and so forth. Did you also use the words happy birthday to you? <laughs> yes, we did. That's a first of tears, or whatever, a denouement, right? So uh, now I don't know what was said because they were told to say it in a deposition, but I don't think this part uh, was anything that anyone would make up. So there were two quick interventions I'd like to ask. Andrew, you, you were going to mention something about we, we talked a little bit about Janacek and street cries and, and, uh, and uh, speech melodies. Um, and, and well, please butt in, but I will remember what you said. And, right, no, if you had those words in front of you, I forgot to print that out. Okay, so, well, a Andrew had said that this seems to be like, like Janacek and, and, and uh, speech melodies. So the idea of the children participating, modeling, listening to the intonational patterns, etc., and then setting them down. Um, Miriam was going to make a slight intervention because for, for people who know the song, uh, there's a reason that it's, it's a little funny that they're saying we went over it and over it and over it so that the kids could sing it. And Miriam said, well, what's your... Well, an octave lead is almost impossible, not just for kids, but for any untrained adult to sing remotely in tune. That's, I mean, everybody knows that about the song. Um, so yeah. yeah, so it's sort of funny that they make a point of going over it with the children to make sure everybody can sing it, and then it's a song that basically nobody can sing. I mean, if you go to any restaurant, it, it's more like Charles Ives than, 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 than when you hear that. So um, again, uh, she, she writes about, uh, you know, in, in Unconscious Composers, uh, she writes about all this. So 
So I think, you know, my first conclusion would be that good morning to all can be viewed as a kind of collaboration between Mildred and Patty Hill, Dvorak, the school children, and especially the unconscious composers, the Black Street Criers of Louisville. Um, again, I think it's a fitting backdrop for the first song in a secular liturgy aiming to teach children what it means to be American. Uh, considering that this is the case, and even though the song is finally, uh, uh, quite recently, out of copyright, it does seem as if those unconscious composers deserve some royalties. Uh, in the end. Um, now, its all, second conclusion would be that it, it's also always seemed to me that the Mildred and Dvorak and Antonin story is, is like a poor man's O. Henry story. I, I always think, by the way, when I see this picture that he's got like Hebrew on this uh, tie, but it's just some design. Um, I don't think I'm going to be able to read that. Um, so, so the thing that's fascinating for me is that there's no evidence at all that Mildred Hill ever knew that it was her article that played such a formidable role in establishing Dvorak's American style. And Dvorak never knew that this nice southern lady who sent the street cries was the very Johann Tansor who had inspired him. So it's a kind of shippy in the nighty kind of thing. Um, without being too strict about this, I believe there's some sense that people probably have that Happy Birthday is a, a white song or a product of white America. Uh, I would hope that this research suggests that now the burden of proof should be on anybody who wishes to continue with this view. Because there's, again, a whole pile of suggestive, though not conclusive, evidence to show the opposite. So I believe, certainly now, that the world's most popular song has deep black roots, deep Louisville roots, reflecting Mildred Hill's lifetime commitment to African-American sound, which she believed, again, should be the future. So uh, this is Mildred and Patty Hill together again. Uh, Happy Birthday was published like the New World Symphony in 1893. One was a high culture epic for an elite audience, the other a miniature for children. One was by a man, the other by a woman, one by an American, the other by a Czech. But I believe that these served and shared the same idea, that anything called American should and must represent all the people, that black musical expression was singular and powerful, and that those at the bottom must rise to the top in the creation of any genuinely American music. It's up to all of you, I think, to decide the extent to which these visions were true then and whether they are true today. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the people who came to speak to us, Miriam for, for singing, Andrew, Jim Hopper, James Purcell, and the board. Thank you all very much. We do have some moments if anybody wants to ask some questions, or please, yes, Lisa. Hi, that was an evening, thanks, Mike. Um, have you have you thought about why Johann Hanser would have been the pseudonym, and why did she not? Do you think she couldn't have published as a woman under her own name at that time? And why did she take a German name? It's not, I don't know the, the last name is that German, the Johann sort of suggests. Well, there was a Johann Tanzor who was, uh, you know, a, a 17th century writer about ecclesiastical history, and she may have known about that. Um, I, I think there might have been something playful in the choice. I think there's a, something a little bit, even though I know it's Mildred, there's something slightly more flowery and stylized about it. Um, I, I, and I really don't know enough about her because her, mostly her letters haven't survived. We have the manuscripts, we have the writing, the published things. But um, some reports of, she was an extraordinarily beloved woman in, in Louisville. Um, everyone writes about her with enormous affection. And she seems to have been quite playful as well. So there may have been uh, something in that. You know, um, I, I think 
maybe just as some composers, as we know, wear masks when they write letters, that she was wearing the mask of Johann Tanzor, speaking about Heimweh. Uh, you know, but it is funny, and I should have picked it up sooner. You know, it begins as one who has grown up in the South and signed Johann Tanzor. You know, I mean, not that there can't be, uh, but at that point, there really wasn't. So I, I think it was, she believed she would be taken seriously uh, with a name like that, and, and writing in a style like that, and uh, as they say uh, in New York, it worked. <laughs> Thanks. Please. Look around, see if anybody's gonna call me. My name is Bill Lee. Uh, I found this super interesting. And I would like to think I have just retired some months ago as professor emeritus. And I would like to uh, thank the Filson Club for helping Send me on my way some 40 years ago. It's a great thing. It's a great place. And I don't know what you're building now, but I'll even like the old ones. Um, I did some invest. I like. To, I added a litany of musicians in in uh, Louisville, and one of them was a fellow uh, by the name of Thomas Mason. And Thomas Mason was the brother of the fabulously rich in the early 19th century Louisville Mason. And he wasn't so rich when he was here because he, he operated a factory that puts string around or fabric around cotton bales. And uh, Thomas uh, did become wealthy though. He started making drums during the Civil War and he did become wealthy here. But it's a very interesting connection and the synergy between the uh, German community and between those many people that came from up north to run factories, be uh, leaders in the community. That was really interesting, the synergy between those two groups in Cincinnati, Louisville, St. Louis, and St. Louis. And uh, I'd like to say that these two women th make me think very much of a very similar pair of women, uh, Jessie Gaynor and her uh, sister, who wrote during this period the Slumber Boat Song. The Slumber Boat Song during this period was one of the most famous children's songs ever written, and it was, uh, you know, everybody did it. And uh, she wrote opera, uh, Gaynor wrote opera, very, very much like these people, very much like them. And I would suggest that are these musicians who happen to write children's songs, or were these educationist people who were trying to save, in a typical progressive fashion, trying to save children of progressive child savers? That's the question that I hope somebody will answer. Thank you. Well, I, I think, you know, it's very clear from Patty's work, uh, Patty Hill's work, that she had a concept of kindergarten as the kind of pathway from the home to the world of civic commerce and that the experiences of the child in kindergarten were extraordinarily important for what the child would become and how the child would make that transition, and that these songs were in every way symbolically and actually a critical part of the process and had to be. Um, and I, I think that's one of the things that makes it remarkable. And I, I, again, I don't think it's at all a coincidence that that song was put first, not only because it was Good Morning, but I think it, it, it symbolized everything that they were striving for. Please, any more questions? Do we know anything, thanks, that is session, but do we know anything about the pathway from Mildred Hill to Clayton Sumi, the publishers in, in Chicago? Well, you know, I, th I think we do, and there's, there's a really wonderful article, which I can recommend because I think um, being, um, uh, we're, we're being closed down, that's, that, oh, that Bob Brownice has written an article that's actually online, uh, where he's a, he's a lawyer at uh, George Washington uh, University, and he has an, it's an extraordinary article, and he covers a lot of the territory and goes into great detail about how the song got from Louisville to this publisher. And, and, and then he is the one who directed me towards, you can download all the depositions from the 1935 case, which retell the story as well. So I would recommend, I mean, it's a lot of fun because it's, it's an article that's a good article, but, but all the appendices, um, including our earlier versions of the song, because one thing that was put out was that, that uh, 
Mildred Hill had taken it from an earlier song. But when you look at any of the earlier songs with those kinds, good, happy new year to you, good morning to you, they're all totally different. They lack that kind of pentatonic thing, the, the leaps and all those. But yeah, it's a wonderful story. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Little question? Well, if not, thank you very much for your attention.